Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Diversion Stars podcast. How are my loyal listeners? Thank you for your continued support. And remember, click that subscribe button, everybody. It's an amazing episode because Erica Schultz boards the mothership. You know her as the writer of Hollow's Eve and X-23, Deadly Regenesis. She's now the writer of Christabel on Kickstarter. Come on board as we go traversing the stars. Hello, Ms. Schultz. Thank you so much for coming to Traversing the Stars podcast. Thank you for having me. It's totally an honor to speak with you. So I always start off with the question of inspiration. So what inspired your love of comics and who are your earliest influences? All right. Who, what inspired my love of comics? I have an older brother and I used to be the annoying little sister who would just steal anything he had. <laughs> uh, so that's, that I guess was my love of comics. Um, who's my inspiration? Um, you know, the earliest comics that I read were, uh, uh, basically X-Men, you know, Claremont was writing and whether it mm. was, you know, Cockrum or John Byrne or um, Terry Austin, you know, and then Jim Lee, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, I would say that they are an influence just because those were pretty much the first comics that I was, uh, that I was engaging with. In terms of if I have to look back and say who's an influence in my particular type of storytelling, um, yes, I would say Chris, Chris Claremont. Uh, I would also say, uh, Kelly Sue DeConnick. I would say, uh, Gail Simone. I would say, um, I mean, Kelly Thompson does great work too. Um, and I would basically say, and it's not just comics as well. I mean, like I studied English in, in college and, you know, mm. yes, I was that annoying poetry major. Um, but you know, like you sort of like epic storytelling in general, you know, like Coleridge, Keats, Wordsworth. I mean, they had these, you know, phenomenal ways of out of, of laying out a story because to me it's it's a lot about the pacing. Mm. Um, so so I I kind of draw like little influences here, there, and everywhere. Um, but in terms of my introduction to comics, it was mostly, you know, Chris Claremont during that huge run when he was writing. So um, how does I think it was like was 17 years or something? Mm. <laughs> so how does the poetry major have that seep into your comic book writing? Well, it's funny because uh, we're actually prepping for a Kickstarter right now for uh, a comic called Christabel, which is based on a poem that Samuel Taylor Coleridge wrote in uh, 1797 was when he wrote the first part. He wrote the second part in 1800, and it was supposed to be five parts, but he only wrote two. Oh. Uh, so I've sort of taken it upon myself to adapt the two parts that had already been written and then complete the story. Ooh, wow. Ambitious. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is genuinely a poem that I have been, there's two poems that I've obsessed over since college and I graduated literally last century. Um, so one is, uh, Christabel by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. The other is by Robert Browning called Porphyria's Lover. And I also have an, a sci-fi adaptation of that that I would love to get done um, in the next couple of years too. And those are the two poems that have, you know, kept me up at nights, you know, for the past, God, what is it, 24 years now since I graduated? <laughs> so so when know, you say- so 20 plus, we'll say. So, so when you say adapted, are you maintaining the poem, poetry structure in the in the writing, like say cap with captions or anything like that, or is it in the story you're adapting? It's uh, it's the story that that he's telling that I'm adapting. Um, I tend to write nonlinear. Um, I, I mean, I have written linear stories, but I tend for the most part to write nonlinear. Um, and the story that he lays out is very linear. It's this happened, then the next, then the next, then the next. He also starts with the character of Christabel as a young woman. Um, well, back then she would be considered a young woman. We would say she's, you know, a young teen. Mm. Um, but, you know, if you're 14 and you're not married back then, <gasps> you know, <laughs> like horror. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so he, he, you know, starts with her at around the age of 14, uh, give or take. And we, you know, delve into that part of it. But we also go into, we have her at, uh, at you know 26 mm. um and we see how 
how some of the events of what he talks about, how that then shapes who she becomes as a woman later in life. And, you know, some, you know, not, I wouldn't say trauma. Well, yeah, kind of maybe. <laughs> but basically, like we see her story and I just sort of build on that and take it into a different direction. Um, I'm working with Amagoya Aguirre on art, fantastic artist. Um, my go-to editor is always James Emmett. Uh, I've worked with him on Deadly's Bouquet, which is out for Image. Uh, we worked together on, on loads of other projects. Um, really great editor. Um, I always tell people hire him, but then I'm always like, don't hire him because <laughs> I need him to. And James, <laughs> James is one poor, one man dealing with all this stuff. Um, but, uh, James is phenomenal to work with. So, so we're really excited about it. I'm, I'm, I'm really pumped about how the story is unfolding. It's going to be three volumes of about, uh, each volume, depending on how well the Kickstarter does, we're going to add pages. Um, but each story, it's going to be three, uh, volumes of at least 60 pages of story each, kind of like how the Wonder Woman Historia was coming out, mm. you know, so it's like a premium you know, flop, it's not a floppy. It's like, you know, perfect bound, square bound, you know, a premium book. Um, and we've got, uh, we've got covers by Skylar Patridge, Natasha Alterici, Allison Sampson and Fabian Lillet are doing covers. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. I was literally just working on like the Kickstarter before we jumped on. Oh, that's awesome. I, I, I know how that goes. I actually have my, uh, my own, I'm not going to go into much too much, but in a, what, what days of the 12th in 12 days i have one of mine uh, launching okay, um cool. so so yeah I, I know i know that that flutter that you get when you know the kickstarter is coming and the notification count it it it, it is it, it is very nerve-wracking <laughs> this is your first it is and you're like you're constantly refreshing yes like 80 times it's like oh it went up by one right you know? oh i had a good um, day today it went up by four i was like oh this is like a red letter oh, day the pre-launch page <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's awesome so I was very excited. I was like, oh, my God, four. <laughs> I mean, it's it, it really is very, very nerve wracking. And, you know, I mean, we are blessed living in, in a time that, you know, we have something like Kickstarter. We have crowdfunding platforms that we can get our work out. Um, but it doesn't sort of remove the stress of it. It doesn't remove the the sort of like nail biting moments. You know what I mean? Um, not just watching the clock count down, but also like building up to it. Mm. Um, Kickstarters are, are very, it's funny. Somebody said something to me about, um, oh, it's good to have a Kickstarter. It's passive income. I was like, that is not passive. <laughs> Kickstarters are the furthest thing from passive. I mean, and I say Kickstarter, I mean crowdfunding just in general. Right, Kickstarters right, right. become like the word Band-Aid, you know, yeah. um, or Kleenex. You know, it's it's not passive at all. You have to be actively yes. involved in it. Um, I, I'm working with Jaslyn Stone, who is a phenomenal uh, marketer, um, and and I would love, and I'm glad to call her a friend. Um, so she's helping with the Kickstarter, which is fantastic because I'm like, I don't, I I, I did this with Deadly's Bouquet, you know, two years ago, and it was insane. I don't know if I could do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I was like, uh... Jaslyn, please help, please help. Me. So yeah. Well, like I said, I also do publish work on the side because, you know, uh, and I will say because it's, you know, your, you know, it's your name, you're in everything else. I get as invested with their projects as I do with my own. It, it is, is nervous, especially because most of these Kickstarters always gets that low. There's always a lull in a Kickstarter yes. and those are crushing sometimes and they can feel like they, they feel almost eternal when they happen. <laughs> and, you know, and I think it's, but I think it's sort of natural that everything's going to plateau but you could be intellectual about it but there's still a very um, right. erratic emotional component to it so it's like you can say like oh well you know this is perfectly normal when you when you're looking at the graph and it rises yep. up and then it plateaus and you're like oh that's perfectly normal but at the same time inside you're like <gasps> you're like right. totally freaking out i'm never gonna make this and you know i it's it, yeah it's a lot it's it a lot it kind of reminds me of um because I'm a baseball nerd as well as a comic book nerd, and like when you watch baseball, you talk and you hear some players talk about slumps. They say like once you get to like oh and twelve, oh and fourteen, you feel like you're never gonna get a hit ever again. Yeah. Same thing with the Kickstarter. Once you get that day goes by, and nothing changed, and the second day nothing, you're like you feel like you're never gonna get a pledge ever yeah. again. It's brutal. Yeah. 
<laughs> and even and that's the thing is like even if you make your you make your uh, initial goal, those days though, still because you what people I think who've never run a crowdfunding campaign don't know is that even if you've made your goal, once you hit that date and it's over, you don't really get exactly what that money is oh, yeah. because you know the platform will take a, a percentage which which is fine that's that's the point yeah. but then there are people that uh their credit cards aren't going to go through properly mm. or there are people that are going to cancel their pledge just before it funds yeah or just before the end of the campaign so you might say like it might say yes you hit your funded goal of $100 and you're going to get $110 you're not going to get $110 Right. You know, you're going to get the 10 percent that Kickstarter takes and then you're going to get, you know, five people are going to pull their pledges. So you'll be lucky to walk away with like 70 bucks, you know, and I'm just yeah. using that as, a, as right. an easy round number. But um, but yeah, so you 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 don't just want to hit your goal. You want to surpass yeah. it greatly because you want to make sure that, you know, for any of you know, and it's literally it's just like the law of averages kind of thing. You know, you know, yeah. there's going to be um debits that happen oh yeah you have to really be prepared yeah there's always that negative um usually it's it's a pretty big it's when the bigger bid always seems to be the one that gets pulled like usually to me it's always like i find it's like around the eight seventy two hundred dollar one that someone yanks like right in the last day and pulls it out for whatever reason but once again it's a little crushing especially when you're plateauing to not to fall back a little bit it, it it it's tough and it makes you wonder who is doing that whether or not you know it's hostile or it's like someone whose intent was intent to help you and then realize at the end oh crap i don't have it and they back out yeah. it, it, it it's it's hard and then once again there's other stresses as well once you're done with the campaign and you got to fulfill it you start realizing what you thought you had is a little tighter than you actually end like the printing cost and shipping cost is a lot different than you think it is. So just because yeah. you you sold a comic book for ten bucks, let's say you probably should print today for three fifty. You probably are shipping it for eight or nine dollars. You know, with the packaging and everything else, you only made probably like a buck on that on that sale that you think you did. You know. Well, that's the thing is like you know, the, uh, Greg Pak, who's a phenomenal writer, yep. writes Darth Vader, Hulk. Um, he did a kickstarter for a kickstarter a book about kickstarter and it is fantastic and to the point where when i used to teach at the kubert school um we used to talk about teaching from this book because and it's and and the examples that he gives are not these sort of like nebulous examples he'll say let's pretend you have a budget and your budget is ten thousand dollars and he will go through every single beat of it. And it's, I mean, it's literally, it's like the textbook of how to do any type of crowd, uh, any type of crowdfunding um, operation, you know, whether you're doing a book or a short film or whatever. Um, and I just, I tell everybody, go to Greg's website, look at this thing, read it, read it again, you know, read it mm. three times before you say, yes, I'm going to do a crowdfunding uh, campaign, you know, um, because one of the things that uh, I, I've noticed and that people who've read it and then come back to me have said is um, there are questions that he answers that I didn't even know to ask. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, it's, it really is important to be as, as crazily prepared as you can. Yep. Um, because, you know, there's always going to be, it's, it's Murphy's law. You know, there's always going to be something that, that happens. And like you said, you're going to sort of, underestimate something or overestimate something and uh yeah it's gonna kind of blow up in your face but you know what are you gonna do you just you just gotta you go through it the only way the only way uh, what is it the only way out is through right, you know, right. i think it's i think it's i think it's uh, robert frost said something in in those terms mm. so yeah there's the poetry major coming back <laughs> so for someone like me once again who has a Kickstarter, helps other people promote their Kickstarters. In your experience, what's the go-to platform for marketing for um, marketing yourself? I find that each one has become increasingly hostile to Kickstarter links. Um, you're saying platform in terms of social media platform? Yeah, if, if, yeah, for us promoting okay. yourself and posting. 
Honestly, uh, I'll, I'll be honest. That was something that I was I was actually very worried about um, because we had been talking, James and I, the editor, had been talking about going to Kickstarter, you know, um, last year, earlier last year, um, around New York Comic Con, which is October time. Mm. Um, so we were we were talking about that, and that's when sort of Twitter was going further and further down the rabbit hole that it's going now. Mm. Um, and we were having this whole conversation about sort of the dilution of your, the dilution, dil diluting of your, um, of your follower count. Mm -hmm. And so what I found is that, you know, you've got X amount of followers on Twitter, X amount of followers on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Mastodon, Hive, Spoutable, you know, mushroom whatever there's like literally so many different ones that i don't even know mm. about uh counter social something whatever i don't know <laughs> but i kind of feel like you know we've been diluted some mm. so at this point in my strategy and i've said this pretty much across every platform i have i've said look i'm going to be doing this kickstarter in a month um, if you follow me on this platform and other platforms, you're going to see a lot of the same stuff. I, I apologize, but it's part of the job. Mm. That's the job. And it's the same thing with Hallow's Eve, which came out, um, today's Thursday, it came out yesterday. Uh, you know, I was posting a lot. Hey, Hallow's Eve is going to be in stores, you know, this, this coming new comic book day. I'm going to be posting a lot saying, Hey, X23 is coming out next Wednesday you know, kind of thing. And yeah, I post a lot of the same stuff to this, to each different social media platform because some people have actually left Twitter completely. Yep. There are people that follow me on Twitter, on here, on there, on everywhere, but there are people who have completely left Twitter. And if I want to reach them, which you want to reach obviously the most amount of people as possible, you've got to post everywhere else to be able to catch any of the, I don't want to say stragglers, because that, that seems kind of, you know, I don't know, it seems kind of rude to call somebody mm. a straggler, but but you want to catch all of those people who may have abandoned one social media platform for another. Um, and the other thing is that when you're doing any type of crowdfunding or any type of promotion in general, because even just saying, hey, you've got to, you know, when you're in the direct market, you have to pre-order books. So, hey, you know, issue number two, the final order cutoff is March 13th for, you know, Hallow's Eve number two and X-23 number two. Make sure, you know, you you tell your comic shop you want to order it. Um, it's, it's basically you're dropping a rock in the water and you have your circle and you're hoping that your circle will branch to their circle. And then their circle, I mean, and there's always going to be overlap, mm. of course, but you're hoping that the parts that don't overlap in that Venn diagram then just keep branching out and branching out because you want the broadest possible spectrum of people uh, possible. Yeah, when, I, when I'm thinking about social media, I always think about it like a, almost like a rule of 10. Like whatever amount of followers you have, about 10% will see whatever you post and 10% of them will actually do something about it. So maybe get 100 people, yeah. maybe one of the 100 will actually go forward and click on the thing you ask them to click on. And that's like, that's the kind of numbers you're playing with, I think, in, in the world of promotion. Yeah. And that's, and what basically you're trying to do is you're hoping that that person, that one out of a hundred will then share that to their circle and that any non overlapping person out of that, you know, 10% of 10% then does something and then shares mm. it to the, to the next circle, because you're really wanting to just reach out. I mean, Comics is a small community. Yeah. So there's a lot of people that will, you know, I, I, you know, help your Kickstarter, you help my Kickstarter, you help his Kickstarter, I help his, you know, and there's a lot of, um, you know, just constantly, I, I made the joke to, to a friend of mine, I was like, we're literally just passing the same dollar bill back and forth to each other. <laughs> um, but you, what you want to also do, I mean, as great as that is, because obviously you need that community, but what you also want to do is you also want to branch out mm. even further than that and make sure that you're hitting people that not necessarily know about Kickstarters or not necessarily are in the community. Um, you know, like 
it's it's really weird. When we did the Kickstarter for Deadliest Bouquet, which was um 2021, it was really weird. I posted about it on LinkedIn, and you know, with the analytics of uh, on Kickstarter, I, I'm yeah. not uh, familiar with um, the analytics on other platforms, but Kickstarter specifically will tell you where someone clicks that link from. Yep. And I got a bunch from LinkedIn, and it was funny because it was all these old timers that. When I first started at the ad agency back in like 1999, it was all my creative directors <laughs> and all the people that I was the assistant for are all like clicking the link, like, oh, let's see what our little Erica's up to these days. <laughs> like, yeah, little Erica's, you know, in her forties now and owns a house. So, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not the, the, the short little college grad living in the, you know, roach infested <laughs> apartment in Brooklyn anymore. <laughs> but you, but you know what though, uh, take whichever one, you know, gets it. If, if I have a ex coworker yeah. from 10 years ago that wants to click my, the, the, my link, thank you so much. You're now my friend once more. <laughs> uh, well, that's the funny thing is like, I always make a joke. It's like, you know, uh, I'll see an old creative director or somebody that I, I used to work with a million years ago, say something like, you know, oh, wow, it's so great to see what you're up to. Like, I didn't know you were into comics. I'm like, what are you talking about? On slow days, I was literally reading them at my desk. <laughs> Obviously, you weren't paying attention. Um, but yeah. So it's probably for the best that you weren't paying attention. Yes. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so when is the Kickstarter that you're talking about uh, launching? Uh, Christabel's Kickstarter will launch on March 28th. So end of this month. So I got one, two, three. I have three full weeks and a couple of days so i will be uh be a, a lot of ko pectate drinking and pepto stressing <laughs> out that entire time yeah uh but oh it's and then you stress for the entire time that you're there yep. you're, you're th you know you're you're running the, the campaign and then you stress after with fruit and then you stress out after for uh fulfillment right so. Like I said, it's 30 days of hell when, when, when you finally launch. Because usually, I, I, most people do about 30 days. So it's about 30 days of hell. Yeah. Then the fulfillment panic when you realize, can I say what I, can I do what I said I was going to do with all this, you know, the rewards and everything else? Did I misprice the re, the rewards when I did this? What, what's the damage going to be? It, it, it is. Did, I, are did, fun. I, did I miscalculate the weight? Oh, yes. The, the, yeah, that's, that's a, the shipping is absolutely brutal. Yes. <laughs> Especially, it's gone up. We had done, so we had done the Kickstarter for Dudley's Bouquet and it ended um, uh, mid uh, to late June. And we were looking to get fulfillment out uh, around Thanksgiving time. And I get an email in my inbox in like September saying from the USPS saying, just so you know, media mail rates are going up. Oh. And I'm like, what? Because I based everything yeah. on the media mail rates when the Kickstarter was approaching, not knowing that media mail rates were going. And I'm just like, wow, thank you. <laughs> thank you. But like we said, like there's that, you know, there's always this inevitable thing that happens that you're just sort of like, oh, well, just got to find a way through it, you know, kind of yeah. thing. So, yeah, I get it. I get it. A hundred percent. Well, another fun part of the kickstarter is figuring out what rewards to give so what so what's going coming this time and how excited are you with these i'm actually so we've got four different covers for the book so you can choose your cover we've also got um we're gonna have my my friend kevin maher who designed the logo did these really cool uh sort of like monograms of mm. uh the c for christabel and he did it in you know the very old school black letter style you know gothic black letter style and uh so we're gonna get magnets of those and then i found and i don't know how well it's going to show up on camera because it's kind of white on silver mm. so i don't know how much it's going to show up but i found this company that did um First of all, they do metal business cards, which to me, I'm just like, that is a huge like expense. And all yeah. I can think of is that at Comic Cons when I've got like my business cards in front of my table and people just come by and like grab like a handful. I'm like, no. <laughs> um, but we got these metal um, yeah, unfortunately yeah, you can see uh, them a little, little bit. bit. So we got these metal bookmarks that have the monogram C 
and it says Christabel down the front and then has the sword. Very cool. It's a sword, not a cross. I promise. It's, you can <laughs> see, you can see it has a pointy end when you actually look at it. But I can, I can see where people might think it's a cross, as in, you know, something Christian. But no, right, right. it is a sword. I promise. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> um, but we got these, and they're and they're really cool because what they do is they kind of etch it in, and you can actually choose a color. I, I wanted to see how the white on silver went, but it actually it went really. I'm trying to get the lighting right so you can see it. Um, I, I was really, I was really pleased with these. So these are one of the, um, also one of the uh, rewards. We also have uh, doing sort of like a grab bag. I got the idea from Jimmy Palmiotti because you know mm. uh, Paper Films, uh, his company. He does, you know, he, I mean, it's for him. It's the business plan. Like he's just churning out Kickstarters, whether it's Painkiller Jane or um you know whatever he's just turning them out and um he had done a thing where it's kind of like a blind box where you know and he's got comps from you know 30 years ago and so you basically like you pay a little extra and you get a a random comic a random floppy that he did signed and everything so i'm like you know i've got random floppies lying around why not? Um, and we did that for uh, Deadliest Bouquet, and and I got to you know get a couple of things out of the closet. Um, so I'm hoping to do that again. That was very cool. So March, it's March 28th. Is the notification page up? It is not up yet. Um, I do have. I went through the. Uh, you, have, you know, you have to have the verification process. So I went through the verification process, and we're we're all set. Um, I just want to have Jaslyn and James give it one more look before I hit yes, put up the notification uh, page. Um, so I know that a lot of people, this this weekend is not the best weekend for that simply because um, uh, Emerald City is happening this weekend. So obviously that's a huge show. Um, so I'm just waiting for them to get back to me and then uh, and then we will put it up and then you will see it on every social media platform <laughs> that you follow me on. It will be possibly copy and paste, sometimes not, but you will see it everywhere. So you gotta be careful with that copy and paste. Believe it, I, I was doing so many promotions for my my clients on Facebook that Facebook hit me as a robot spammer and suspended oh. me for copying. So the key to not being hit by a, as a spammer, this is what I've been le learning because I actually still okay. got warning suspension. At one point, I was suspended for thirty days off the account for spamming. Uh, what you gotta do is you copy and paste the majority of what your message is, and then you type uh -huh. out three or four words at the top. The typing at the top oh. makes apparently make clear sort of not think that you're a robot spamming and that you're reposting each time regular as a normal human. So you got to type out because I was posting every day because I had um, three or four clients at, at a time at one point. So every single day I was posting to 30 groups for each individual client all through Facebook. And then that's why I started getting suspended for that. Um, because but, it just saw you copy paste, copy paste, copy, copy paste, paste. And, and said that okay. you're spamming and you're and that breaks the um, is a term violation. A user violation is spamming. So Interesting. What, okay. I, what I've changed to, and I finally figured out what to do is if I type at the front, like, so I'll post the copy and paste of the link and everything. And my main cut, you know, little th blurb is yeah. say something like um, click, uh, click notification. And by typing and click notification, apparently Kickstarter no longer views, I mean, uh, Facebook never views it, no longer views it as spam. And I've not been hit since. So okay, that is actually really good advice. Thank you. Yeah. So be careful of copy paste. Copy paste can be a killer. That usually they allow okay. ten copy and paste before they start paying attention to you. And then what happened okay. was, and I'll, I'll say one other little thing that, that I learned because I, I got screwed so bad. I was so frustrated because my I thought my business was but like. You, totally but this is great information now for the next time. Like now you know, like, right. You know where the parameters are. Yeah. What happened too? This is why Facebook is um, really interesting. So when I got suspended. What I did was I created two or three fake accounts to keep going, okay. but Facebook was tracking the link. So immediately oh. after posting on from the new account, because also the friend count is smaller and you don't have many posting, it started yeah. sh shutting down each fake account when I posted that link out. So once okay. you do it, you got to be careful of that copy and paste or your link will be um, red flagged and you're going to get screwed. So always okay. copy, paste, write something. Okay. It takes a little extra time to type something out every single time, but if it's three or four words, three or four words is going to save you from potentially two or three weeks of suspension, of suspension at a very bad time. That's actually, that's really good advice because I, I do know that some of the platforms, um, 
I had posted a link, but I hadn't written anything up top. And I guess it doesn't show like the thumbnail underneath. Yeah. So someone tagged me and said, you're not supposed to post blind links. And I, and I had assumed because many of the platforms do show the thumbnail underneath, or at least will show an icon and then have the headline. So I was like, oh, I, I apologize. Like I didn't, you know, I didn't think that it was going to be uh, a blind, um, a blind link. So what I would, what I've been doing is instead of just, you know, copying and pasting the link, I'd say, you know, check out this review for Hollow's Eve number one from graphic policy or AIPT or whatever, and then put the link. Um, this way someone can see what it is and then decide because that's, that's what, uh, I, that's what that person had, uh, the admin had taken umbrage with is this fact that it was a blind link and yeah. he didn't know whether or not he should click it. So I was like, oh, okay, well, that's what I've been doing now is just, you know, like check out this review or like, you know, check out these preview pages right. kind of thing. Well, um, I know Reddit does that. Um, they, they're very, um, I don't want to say Nazi-ish, but they're very particular about their posting on Reddit groups. I noticed that Reddit okay. is brutal about that kind of stuff. Um, I know Tribal, the thing doesn't pop up usually. Um, the okay. thumbnail doesn't pop up. Um, Spoutable, I, I, I'm i seeing issues where it doesn't pop up normally. And I see also with um, Hive, it, it's some you got to put in the picture for Hive because the, the, the thumbnail won't pop. Um, yeah. which, which creates a second problem because I think people see the picture. It's, people will click on the picture faster than they'll look for your link. So by having to put yeah. in the picture, you're now creating an extra step, which is the same reason uh, why um, there's, there's apparently there's a a myth, I think. I think it's a myth that if you post on Facebook and you don't put in the link in the um, post, but you put it in the comments, that somehow more people will see you. Apparently, that's supposed to be a trick because uh, Facebook. So you wait, you, so hold on. So you put you make a post, but you don't put the link in and then you comment on your own post with the link with the link in the comments. Right. Uh, supposedly how it works is that there's a Facebook algorithm because Facebook um, historically does not like Kickstarters, nor do they like YouTube. The okay. reason is because they take you off the platform because they make you go to separate platforms. So they 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 don't like that from a point of view of advertising. So the philosophy. So what people have said is that They're making enough money. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, so, so the philosophy is that if you post it and you say linking comments, then you first comment in, you post the link. Supposedly, you'll get viewed more. But the catch is, while you get viewed more, people are less likely to look in the comments for the link because that's an extra step that people won't do. So now it becomes a juggling thing. Is it worth the extra view? If you get viewed a hundred more times, but even less, but only a small, you know, less people will now go ahead to that comment. Are you now ahead or behind where you would have been anyway? So it becomes kind well, of like this weird balancing act. So I'm wondering if you put in your post, check comments for link. Uh, yeah, that, that's what I'm talking about. So now, but now you're yeah. making someone psychologically make one extra step and you know how people are about the extra step. So yeah. it's one of those things where on the one hand, more views, but those views are going to have less clicks. So it's one of those yeah. weird balancing acts that I have yet to figure out if it's worth it or not to make to do the extra work of commenting. And and it's funny because um, a, a friend of mine who's a small business, a local small business owner, was talking about you know advertising on you know Instagram and Facebook and everything, and talking about sort of like chasing the algorithm, um, but was saying that you know it, it almost felt as if every time you think you've actually figured it out, they've changed it. You know, yeah. so you're you're sort of always on your back foot with it which is you know i don't know but like i said they're making enough money so whether or not they cl somebody clicks off you know it's you're fine you're you're, you're not going to be starving this winter uh right, right. Is that word? <laughs> but yeah it it, it 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 used to drive me crazy especially like i said because um copy and pasting was such a quick move like 30 minutes i can post 30 you know 30 plus groups and it was fast it was easy but yeah now it's an now it's an hour of promoting now instead of 30 minutes and you know, and it pretty much is because Facebook was like, nope, you know, too easy. Nope, let's let's try something different. Um, the new yeah. thing that it, it it did to me now, and it, it looks, and I tried seeing what the problem is, and I can't figure it out. Once again, I post to so many groups all the time, and I'm in something like 600 groups. That now yeah. my groups don't show up in group. Like when I type in search group, I gotta now go to my own personal group, go down the line, and and click groups one at a time instead of searching for them. And now it's, it's a, like I feel like like Facebook That's has weird. fears of, for, for, has gone further and further constricted what I've been able to function on Facebook. But once again, as you said, they're rich enough not to have to worry about it, but they do. 
Well, is that a problem that, that other people, well, my question is, is that a problem that other people have had, or is that a problem that you have because they technically did suspend you at one point? I, I'm not 100% certain yet, because I, once again, I, there's not a lot of people who do necessarily what I'm doing, which is posting okay. 30, 40 times, because I also post for my podcast. So on any okay. given day, I'm posting to probably 30 to 70 groups, different, either the a Kickstarter for somebody or myself or the podcast. Yeah. So it's hard to know, is that a me thing or is that because I got suspended before a thing because of spamming? It, it's hard. But um, it, it's, the, I would say social media is rough. Um, and wow. every single platform apparently has its own unique problem to make it, that makes yeah, it difficult. Definitely. One thing I will say, I mean, like we were talking about the multiple different platforms. You know, I, I think Hive is great. The biggest issue for me is that it doesn't have a desktop. And someone was saying, oh, that there there is a sort of a desktop. Um, there's a desktop way of doing it uh, with, uh, not with iOS, but with Android. And I'm like, well, it's it's very complex to get that way. I'm not a Luddite at the same time. Right, like, right. I don't have time to go through like that, all those steps just to get it when everything else pretty much has some type of desktop uh, interface. Um, also, I mean, it's a lot easier to edit on your desktop than it is to edit, you know, in in your phone and, you know, autocorrect fixes it and then you, you know, send it out and then you're like, oh, crap, I have a typo. And, the, you know, I mean, it just it just turns into like this complex thing. But, you know, like I said, it's just you got to do it. And it's uh, See, I, capitalism. I find, <laughs> see, I find Hive um, difficult for me. Like I do better on Twitter and Facebook than Hive. Which I find on Hive, whether or not, I mean, I, I don't use Hive so often. So my follower account is only like maybe like 150, 160 at the book. I don't use it that often. But I find because that, that there's not as much hashtag um, activity on that than as you do on yeah. Facebook and uh, Instagram. Instagram has a lot of Instagram hashtags, you know, and so many people see it on Instagram, but because it doesn't show, highlight your link. Is almost worthless because no one then has to copy and paste your link and then you might as well just kill yourself <laughs> at that well, point i mean well for that excuse me for that what i've been finding is like literally every 12 hours posting a reel with you know the link at, not a reel i'm sorry um a story and you know having the uh, clickable link within the story oh, okay like, but like every 12 hours you have to do that you know 12 yeah. or 14 hours, whatever. And it's just, it's very time consuming to do that. Especially considering Instagram could literally just make the, the links work and you'd be rolling. Yeah. I I don't understand why they don't make the links work. It's probably some, I don't know. It's probably like Facebook. Like don't, probably Facebook don't, don't leave the, the uh, platform. That's <laughs> yeah. kind of thing, you know? <laughs> but, Pretty much. Yeah. But like I said, it, it, it's difficult. That's why I think it's fascinating to listen to people try to figure out how to make theirs work because everyone seems to have a very interesting way of doing it. So yours is basically just post crazily as many often as humanly possible everywhere you can think of. And once again, try to beat the numbers. Yeah. And, and just, you know, and I've already sort of prefaced it with an apology. You know, I'm really sorry, but, you know, it's, this is, and, and, you know, and I think, for the most part, people understand, you know, mm. especially, especially if most of the people in your community or most of the people like within your, your circles, your followers and stuff are within the community or community adjacent, mm. you know, they get it. Um, so they're not the ones that are like, really like, oh, damn it, Erica's posted again. <laughs> you know, they, they understand. I mean, they, they, they know that the algorithm is going to put you you know, last or, you know, continually start bumping you down. So they, they, they get, they get that you kind of have to game it, mm. but you know, how well you game it is obviously. <laughs> so when you launch, you know. are, you, are you launching with a live show? Or are you just going to quietly launch? Oh man. Now you're, now you're making me like worry about things. I'm still working on the video. <laughs> see, see, wait, 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 I always tell my clients launch as with a live show. Cause it's, cause I, they actually believe in live shows really do well because um either through instagram like or Insta? something like do, yeah i was gonna say yeah like, instagram like lives Insta, so, yeah. so what i used to have my clients do and i still have them do from the ones that listen to me is what you do you go on instagram and you and you have a live show and what i sometimes have on the do have them do a live show you have people that you know who are other artists were because artists are the only ones who are really paying attention to you anyway and then you have right. them come on for like two minutes punch their things while they're also on your chat and they're pumping you as well 
And usually you watch yourself um, up to the point of launching. And then you watch the numbers go up when you hit launch. Then you have like a celebration as, and I've seen people br break their numbers within like 10 minutes doing live shows and you do it on air. And it, it's, it's pretty cool. It gets people talking about you because they're watching you because now, now I got to write this down in my notebook. <laughs> but because they're live they're promoting, show for Insta. Right. Because like I said, because they're promoting themselves for a couple of minutes as well, because you'll let them all, you let guests come on for a minute or two on your show. Yeah. They're promoting them. They'll promote your show as well to get their friends to watch them come on for their two minutes. And usually sometimes it builds something kind of interesting. You'll get maybe 40, 50, 60 eyes on it. And then you have a watch celebration. And like I said, you'll potentially hit your number, depending on how big your number is within hopefully. Like I've seen it. The fastest I've seen is 10 minutes to hit um, uh, 1500. The But I've also seen um, in an hour people hit uh, two to 3000. Uh, on from on the on live so you want to make it live if you can i'm I'm literally like i'm writing it down literally <laughs> like because because you know you have the running list of things that you have to do for the kickstarter you have yeah. to do the video you have to make sure you have uh your your reward icons and, and everything you know so and, and i'm going through that list of you know these are the things i have to do um so yes now i have launching kickstarter via instagram live get people on the live to chat okay it, 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 it it's and, it and it's actually kind of fun too because it's like you know say because it's, it's fun it's good you're chatting about things everyone's trying to like boost up each other to get confident about the uh um the show the insanity and, that they're then, right. you know you know willingly putting themselves into yeah yeah and then yeah. Er, er, you'd be surprised how many of them will also watch you on the on the kickstarter and they'll refresh with you and they're like made it to 100 made it to 500 made it to a thousand and it, it it's a fun. Usually they're pretty fun that way. Um, this will be the first my Kickstarter on March fourteenth is gonna be the first time because I I usually this is only like the second time I've ever done a Kickstarter on my own because okay. I promote other people. I don't usually do my own for you know for different reasons. And this will be the first time doing my own live show. So I'm, I'm kind of like so, so usually around March usually about four or five days before I stop promoting the notification and start promoting the show the live show. So I'm going to start that probably around that March 9th. Yeah. So then that gets promoted. And then I'm going to, I have a friend of mine who um, I used to be a client of mine, who's going to help me launch the live on Instagram and kind of be like the, the moderator through it. And um, he'll help me with the launch of the live at that point. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I'm nervous. Cause one problem with being a publicist is that not only do you have to do well, but you have to do well enough for people to believe that you're a good publicist for, your, for yourself. And that becomes even worse. Well, that's the thing. It's like, you know, you have to do well, but you have to do so well that they think that they can take a little, like, can can sort of pull some shine. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, and be able to get it to get it done. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> but that's, but that's the job, you know, uh, every time, every time I complain about something to my mom, she's always like, you you kind of chose you chose this right <laughs> this is what you said you wanted to do right yeah okay i'm like ah, damn it um you know but i i do find it funny that it, you know I, I i am insanely lucky and and i absolutely acknowledge that you know i have an embarrassment of riches in terms of like the projects that i'm lucky enough to work on um and one of the reasons why we launched in March is because we have the two books coming out. We have Hollow's Eve, which came out yeah. yesterday, and then we have X23 that comes out next week. So to sort of, you know, try and ride that, you know, launch wave of yeah. those books, um, you know, with doing signings and everything as well. And that's the other thing is like we have signings for that, and we're then promoting the Kickstarter throughout the signings and such. So, oh, my God, but it's so much work. <laughs> it's so it, much, it, But again, it really is. It's the world I chose. I have nobody to blame for myself. <laughs> well, it's so. sort of there's, there's been a debate on some people are doing on Twitter with that if you're going to be a comic book artist, do you must you also be a comic book businessman? I'm saying yes, you are automatically unless you don't care about money or having a career, you're just as much a business person as and a promoter, marketer as you are an artist. You have no choice yeah. but do both. Well, see, this is the thing. So, so a lot of people who are in comics, um, they have day jobs and, you know, the day job pays, either pays their bills or pays most of their bills and the comics are gravy. Um, I am a full-time freelancer. I am a full-time writer, full-time uh, editor, freelance. 
So if I am not working, I am not getting paid. Mm. And um, in that part, I need to be the business person as well. Um, I know people who have their day job and that, you know, suffices in terms of finances for the household kind of thing. But, you know, they're just kind of blase about doing the comics promotion. At the same time, for me, whether it, it's my day job, whether I have a day job or not, I still want to promote the comics because I kind of feel as if if you as one of the, the contributors and creators are not out mm. there banging the drum, then it almost feels as if you don't believe in the project enough. Yes. And for me, I mean, it's twofold. One, because I really do believe in the project, but two, because it, this is how I'm paying my bills. Whereas I've noticed, like, uh, I saw somebody post, this was, you know, a couple of months ago, somebody posted something on, uh, I think it was Twitter saying something like, you can tell I have a day job because I have invoices for comics I haven't, you know, I haven't sent out yet or something. And I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> you haven't sent your invoices out yet? Like, what is wrong with you? You know, because that's something, you know, and um, and someone was talking about, you know, if you are doing that, you know, that business side, you know, setting aside one day a week where you just do admin work, check on invoices, check on invoices you have to send out, invoices you've sent out, invoices that are coming up, anything that's overdue, you know, sending an email out to, you know, somebody be like, hey, just so you know, you're a week overdue on this invoice or sending an email out saying, Hey, just so you know, you haven't responded to my question of when the deadline is, you know, time's peeling off the calendar. Um, so you have to have some type of organization. I think there's a fallacy that being a freelancer means that you work in your pajamas and, you know, you work whenever you try to work and this, you know, whenever you want kind of thing in half the day spent, you know, watching TV and playing video games and the other half of the day is spent, you know, being creative. Um, and I, I try very hard to keep to a schedule. I try to keep to a 10 to six schedule. So from 10 to six are like my office hours. You know, this is my office, but I, I'm working, I'm, you know, promoting the book or I'm actively writing or I'm actively editing or I'm, you know, writing newsletter posts and, you know, scheduling them to go out and things like that. So I think that if you are doing this full time and you do not have a, a very good way to organize things, then maybe either look to take a class about business organization for creatives mm. um, or look to, uh, if you can afford it, look to get a business manager, someone who will deal with your invoices. I know um, some people, if they have like a literary agent or somebody like that, they handle, you know, okay, this project is, you know, you've come to this point in the project, time to send out invoices. They'll handle that and such. Um, but otherwise, I mean, you have to do it yourself or you're not going to get paid. And again, it comes back to like the promotion thing. If you are not advocating for yourself, for your projects, for the money that you earned and are owed, then, and this is, this is no shade to any company, but they're just not going to care to pay you if you are not actively advocating hmm. for yourself. And I think that that's just a good thing in general to advocate for yourself. Um, you know, whether you're in an uncomfortable relationship, whether it's a working relationship or, uh, you know, uh, family, friends, you know, uh, uh, intimate partner, whatever, you need to advocate for yourself. And you definitely have to do that in the business realm. And if you don't have an agent or a business manager to do that, then unfortunately you have to do it for yourself. Mm. Um, and it's not comfortable sometimes. I mean, everybody jokes about how I like to fight all the time. I, I don't like, I think this is, this is the thing. I don't like to fight, but I will. Mm. I don't go out looking for fights. Um, but you know, I advocate for myself as best I can. And if it gets to the point where you're not, not you personally, obviously, but <laughs> if it gets to the point where, 
you know, a client isn't responding or, you know, the invoices are going unpaid. It's like, look, this is my livelihood. You have your livelihood. I have mine. Yep. Uh, I am sending you this invoice for the fifth time. This is the date it was due, you know, and you have to get that money because otherwise a company's just going to think, oh, well, you know, whatever. This is this is just a side gig for them. Um, and maybe it is. And, mm. it, you know, and I think some people have said, you know, you take it too seriously, Erica, blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, well, I have to, though, because I don't have a, you know, this is not my side gig. This is my my whole gig. Right, 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 right. <laughs> you know, so if 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 I don't get those invoices paid, then I can't pay artists or editors or promotions people or, you know, for ads for the Kickstart or whatever, if I'm not getting paid. So it really, I mean, it really does sort of, you know, that's the only way trickle down economics actually makes sense is with the people who don't have the money. Right. Well, like I said, it doesn't, it doesn't pay to be a passive freelancer. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's no, many people, it doesn't at all. Like, people like artists, some artists who are very like, you know, kind of like meek a little bit like, Ooh, you know, this is my art. I just want to talk about my art. It's like, sorry, dude, you're, you're a, a marketer. <laughs> you, you can't, you can't, well, that, you gotta be loud and proud. <laughs> Well, that's the thing is like some people are saying, you know, like, well, I I just want to do my art for me. I don't want to make money on it. And that then that's fine. But at the same time is, you know, there there is a there is a hard truth. And that is that this is a business mm -hmm. you want to do it for yourself and and just, you know, make your web comic or do your own zines or whatever. Awesome. But if if this is what you want to do as a career in general, and you want a longevity as a career, then there's a certain amount of marketing and promotion that you have mm. to do um, simply to get the jobs, which then lead to more jobs, which then leads to more promotional work, which, you know, and it, it always comes down to this idea of, you know, you're never working on the job that you're working on. You're always working toward the next one. Mm. Um, and if you want this as a career, not as a side gig or something, then that is something you really do have to focus on. And I, and I think that there are people that really aren't prepared for that. Um, and unfortunately, I mean, that is a hard truth. You know, I don't, I, do I love sitting there being like, buy this book, buy this book, buy this book. <laughs> Tell, you know, go to your LCS and tell them that you want to order. This is your previews. This is the previews code, blah, blah, blah. We have all these variant covers. I, you know, it's not comfortable for me to do that. But I also know that the way the direct market works is if you don't do pre-orders, then the book's not going to have the numbers. If the book doesn't mm. have the numbers, then the publisher is going to turn around and say, oh, well, you know, we worked on, you know, this mini series and the first issue was meh. Had man numbers and there's always a drop off between one and two always yeah i mean it could be a drop off of 100 it could be a drop off of 5000 mm -hmm. there's always a drop off um and so you have to anticipate that so your number one has to be good and your number two has to be good and your number three has to be good you know kind of thing because everybody's gonna buy a number one but are they gonna buy that number two are they gonna buy right. that number three so that's why you have to keep banging the drum. And again, we talked about how it, it might annoy people. Well, this is what I, I'm sorry, but. <laughs> well, I, I used to spend a lot of time on um, Comics Beat when everything was on Diamond and you could follow tracking numbers. I used to yeah. spend, spend a lot of time on Comics Beat and they used to do the the month to month breakdown of every company. You know, DC and they do every I'm DC company, every Marvel. Do that too. Right, right. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, John Jackson Miller with uh, Comic Atron because when, you know, when Diamond was the thing. And standard attrition from issues one to two was usually about 60% drop. That was considered okay. standard attrition from one to two. 60% is a huge number. I mean, it's, it, a movie drops 60% from we one week into another. People talk about it. And that's standard in comic books. And yeah, that's kind of the numbers you're living in. Yeah. And and that's what you said. I mean, in in any other form of entertainment, that would be something to talk about. Like if you had a premiere of a show. Yep. And like Mandalorian just came out. So, you know, let's say a million people watched the episode to, uh, yesterday or today, okay? And only 350,000 watch next week. I mean, that's going to be, that is going to make variety. That's going to yep. make 
Hollywood Reporter and everything. But nobody says, oh, this comic book sold 50,000 copies for number one and number two sold 12,000. Yeah. Nobody talks about that. But like you said, you know, Quantumania, I think, you know, did however much the first weekend and then yeah, the 72% weekend. drop. Yeah. So that made the news. But with our business, it almost just feels like, well, that just that's naturally baked in. Yeah. In in a very weird kind of and I don't mean to sound nihilistic about it. And I and I try not to, but but that's kind of it's it's like I'm like, look, I'm accepting the way the, the business works. Does it suck? Yes. Would I love it to change? Sure. Do I know how to make it change? Absolutely not. Right. <laughs> you know, maybe if I if I work up to the level of like a Jeanette Khan or you know like a kathleen kennedy or somebody like that then i can turn around and say all right now i have the ability to say we're making some serious changes right right. and i think that you know especially with covid seeing um people change from diamond as the distributor i think that that was very interesting especially Mm. because there's lunar and i mean there's diamond obviously but then there's lunar and then there's another one i can't remember yeah, I don't remember the other one. Sorry. I, I, I used to, like, sorry, it was all sorry, diamond. Sorry, other one. <laughs> I said when it was diamond, it all made sense. <laughs> when everything was diamond. Well, I mean, well, Simon & Schuster's doing uh, floppies. Uh, yep. a, a Penguin Random House is also doing floppies. So, you know, I mean, it's it's turned into, which is good in the sense that, you know, there's there's not just one, there's not just one stop shop, but at the same time, what I found was very interesting in terms of ordering so especially when trade paperbacks are coming out because some shops are using diamond for trade paperbacks other shops are using penguin random house other shops are using simon and schuster so i was promoting a uh a signing for a trade paperback which when i went on previews world it said the date is i'm making this up but it said march 1st is the date yeah that it's coming out awesome great i called the shop a couple of days before to see to make sure that their order went through and everything and they said um we went to the penguin random house site and it said that the date isn't going to be until uh march 28th and i was like what what do you mean and i was like but the diamond site says march 1st she's yeah but we don't order our trades from diamond we order our trades from... and it's like wait what so <laughs> simply that that right, right. difference in trades makes promoting a nightmare Mm. because you don't know what shop ordered from where (laughs) and it's just like oh so when you're trying to put it hey in stores blah 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 i had friends text me i went to the store and they didn't have it well i guess that store doesn't order from diamond (laughs) and i don't have access to the simon and schuster penguin random house which i have no idea what date (laughs) They're saying it's coming out, so I'm just like, oh god, why? why <laughs> well, but again, is... this is what you chose to do, Erica. Is what you chose right. to do your life. <laughs> well, like, like I said, cause, uh, I mean, it, 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 like I said, benefited and and some drawbacks. Diamond's biggest problem was, was all when it was all diamond. It was you had the monopoly and you had the. Yeah. I think eventually they moved to a 5,000 order minimum to be on their previews, which once again, for a lot of indie people is 5,000. If you can sell 5,000 copies as an indie person, you're not, you're almost not indie anymore. You're, you're, you're yeah. not, you're, you're, you're now pretty much, that's almost um, numbers of image. That's image. That's numbers of boom. That's numbers. I mean, those are serious numbers and 5,000 orders yeah. is, is pretty steep at, was it almost two, $3 a, a copy. Yeah. But on the other hand, having them spread out to four five, six, seven distributors, as you said, chaos ensues. Well, I mean, that's the thing is like, it really, it's, it's just a consistent balancing act Mm. and, and you have to be as cognizant as possible of where the trends are going, who's doing what you cannot know all of it at once because it's just, it is literally too much information for any person, you know, even, even a savant wouldn't be able to do it because it's just too much. And there's too many variables too. Um, Because even with, Let's say somebody does, you know, you know for a fact that this one particular store only orders from Diamond. Well, what happens if there's a shipping issue? Mm. You know, so you can't even count on that. There are literally too many cogs moving and too many moving parts for you to say with 
any certainty that this book is going to be in this store on this shelf on this date. Mm. Um, and then you just sort of, you know, shrug and really hope you don't have egg on your face. I mean, I have a signing at the Geekery in Madawan, New Jersey on the 11th of March on, on Saturday um, for Hallow's Eve and for X23. Hallow's Eve is in stores, or at least in some stores, knocking on wood, I know because I saw a couple. Um, I'm hoping X23 is going to be in stores on Wednesday, next Wednesday. I really hope and pray because if I show up to the to the shop and they're just like, oh yeah, we only have the Hallow's Eve that came in. Okay, I guess that's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> what do you do? You just do the best that you can. Right, right, you know, right. That's, that's all any of us can do. You just do the best that you can. <laughs> Yeah, it, 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 I can't imagine. I mean, luckily, I'm not a freelancer. I mean, I guess luckily, I would love to do a comic book writing as a full-time job, but as a high school teacher is what the bill pays, and that's a little less, 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 less stressful than freelancing on some level. <laughs> yeah, I mean, being a freelancer, it, it it has its ups and downs. I mean, you know, I, on a whim, I wanted a burrito today, so I went and I <laughs> bought a burrito, and I put it on my business card because I'm a freelancer, and I took time, <laughs> it took my lunch hour, and I got my burrito, you know, so that's that is that is a perk of it uh another perk of it is um you know being able to uh um you know there was a really cool uh plugin for photoshop that i saw that i was able to pick up i mean it was it was not expensive by it was literally less than ten dollars um but that's a business expense that is that is a perk um not having health insurance you know paying private health insurance mm is not a perk of being a freelancer having to police your uh invoices is not a perk having to you know consistently keep a notebook of everything <laughs> is not a perk you know having to really be having to stress you know because you have you have lean times and you have fat times you know so having to make sure that you have an emergency fund as best as you can and you know, God forbid something happens, you have to dip into the emergency fund, mm. being able to start putting money back in as quickly as possible. You know, so there are the good and there are the bad to all of it. Just like, you know, having a full time job, there's a lot of stuff that you love about teaching full time, but I'm sure there's some things where you said, you even said it, I would love to be able to write full time. But, you know, so it's everything's got its good and the grass is always greener i mean there are days that i'm like eh, maybe i should look to get getting something full-time and then there are days where i'm like but i wouldn't have time to write you know so mm. it's it's a balancing act it always mm. is it's, so, it's life you're walking so on a balancing beam let's repeat again the name of the book that's gonna be kickstarted it's called christabel christabel and it is it is based on the samuel taylor coleridge poem of the same name I spell it without the H. Uh, he spells it C-H-R-I-S-T-A-B-E-L. Uh, the way I spelled it is without the H, um, just to make it a little a little cleaner. Um, but yes, it is called Christabel. If you, you can look up Coleridge's poem. The parts one and two are there. He had planned five, didn't write parts three through five, because his friend Wordsworth said, eh, it's not, it's not as good as I thought it was going to be. And then he got... Uh, Coleridge got stage fright and didn't finish it. Oh. <laughs> now, from what from my research, because this is where the you know the poetry nerd comes in. From my research, nobody has found even starts of an, any any type of documentation of an outline of anything on three through five parts three through five. Whether or not it was all in his head and he just didn't put it to paper, nobody's found it. If somebody has found it, please, you know, send me a message on Twitter. I would love to see what he had planned for three yeah. people. But, uh, but originally, as as the story goes, obviously, you know, it's 200 years ago, so I don't know, you know, nobody alive who knows the truth. But as the story goes, is he said, this is, this is going to be in five parts. And he put out part one, a couple years later, put out part two, and then the rest of it, you know, the legend is Wordsworth didn't think it was that good. And they were writing partners at the time. They were doing lyrical ballads and, and such. So so that's March 28th. Um, but what, what I will you do, the moment a link becomes available, you need to give it to me so I can put it in the, in the show notes. Yes, to make sure I people... will. The moment the link becomes available, I promise. 
<laughs> so I yeah. just have to have I just have to have James and Jasmine just do one more <laughs> pass, just just another quick just look before I can finally go. Oh, okay, <gasps> and you hit the <laughs> and then you close your eyes, and then you're like, what? Okay, yeah. And just watch the notification numbers just fly up. <laughs> yeah, with luck, with, with luck, luck, fly up. So uh, you're the writer of Hollow's Eve. So how do you get involved in the book, and what intrigued you about Hollow's Eve? Um, how did I get involved in the book? Uh, the easy answer is that uh, Nick Lowe emailed me about a week before New York Comic Con and said, hey, I've got a job for you. <laughs> uh, I was like, uh, okay. Um, so uh, Nick, who is the editor for pretty much all the Spider-Man stuff, and Caden, who um, is uh, the assistant editor who works with Nick, um, we got together and uh, I got a I got to find out what was happening in Dark Web before anybody else did. <laughs> Um, and so they had said to me, you know, we're going to be spitting out from Dark Web, but um, uh, this um, this character, Janine Godby, who has existed in the past. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's, it's the whole Ben Riley when Ben's on the run and, he, you know, he doesn't know that he's the prime clone or whatever. And Kane's chasing him and all that other stuff, clone conspiracy stuff. But I want to say 90, 95, 96, maybe. Um uh, it was a uh, JR, JR, and uh, James D. Mateus uh, worked on it. And so I knew who Janine was, uh, but I we hadn't seen her in a very long time. And she's brought back uh, through the uh, ASM run that they're doing now. And um, Beyond is the, uh, is the um, I guess, the, the title of the arc. And so I was brought in on it and... It was just a very sort of interesting idea because even from the beginning, Janine was always this sort of gray area character um, where she had a very uh, tumultuous past. She was on the run from, uh, she had committed, uh, she had killed somebody in self-defense. And so she was on the run for that. Um, and she always sort of had a distrust of basically of any type of authority because like the courts let her down and the cops let her down and you know so she felt that and at the time ben was sort of you know on the run in his own kind of way so they they really felt a kinship to each other um and they had this this relationship where it was basically you know we're both pretty damaged um and instead of the world not accepting us let's just accept each other mm. So, I mean, there's there's kind of like a romantic sort of idea behind that. Um, I don't know if it's great for mental health reasons, but, uh, <laughs> you know, there's, there's, a, there's a strange romance behind that. And um, so when they were going to bring her back, when they brought her back for Beyond, and then they said that they were going to, um, they were going to give her abilities in the Dark Web um, series, I thought, oh, that's a, that's a cool idea. You know, the whole thing with Madeline Pryor and everything. So I was told about these masks that she has. And, you know, Madeline makes a point in, I want to say it's ASM 14, when she gets her powers, you know, you have this endless bag. And so she has this basically like a messenger bag, a satchel that has a bunch of masks in. And we had this whole conversation about like, well, is it any mask? Like if someone gives her a Spider-Man mask, like a Spider-Man Halloween mask, will she then become heroic? Or a Captain America mask, will she then want to be a good person, you know, right, a good right. guy versus a villain, you know, kind of thing. Um, so we had all these conversations about what the masks were going to be, what not only what were they going to physically do to her, how they were going to physically transform her, but how would it transform her, her personality, mm. um, uh, and how the masks would uh, uh, would affect her her actions and reactions. Um, so we had that long conversation, and uh, and it, it's been it's been pretty interesting writing her and um, and and her being sort of this gray area character. She's not she's not a supervillain. She's not evil, um, but she's been let down, and she's very distrustful. And because she's distrustful, she makes some some pretty some pretty crappy decisions but it's pretty much based on you know survival you know well the, without giving away any spoilers um having read read the issue at the end there's a suggestion that she doesn't just have 
the powers or a similar a similarity to what she wears as a mask but she has the she becomes literally that thing and all the negatives that come with the thing so yes. she's literally and turning that's be, into and the that's thing. going to be explored in issue two okay that, so she, that is definitely explored in issue two so i guess one of the questions when she's choosing her mask because you said there's like endless possibilities for the masks is she like magically choosing which ones come come out is it almost is it does she have a selection process of when is which mask she's using at any given moment or could she just be like i want to be a this thing and then that mask for that thing pops out she has so the masks were made for her so she has a i guess for for lack of a better term she has like a psychic link to it so when she puts her hand in her bag she knows what she's looking for you know, she knows that this is the mask that I want. It's almost, you know, think of it like Ben 10 with the Omnitrix, where like he knows which which uh, uh, alien he wants to go with and then he chooses it. So for Janine, she's like, okay, I know in this position, I need this type of power set. So I'm reaching my hand in the bag. That mask is going to... Uh, is going to be the one that she, you know, she sticks her hand in the bag. That's what's, you know, popping up to the top. And the weaknesses come with the mask, I assume, as well. So whatever the weakness of the thing is the weakness of her at that moment. Yeah. So if, I mean, this obviously, because this is, you know, cross big too, but let's say she had a Superman mask. Yeah. She put on a Superman mask and she turned into Supergirl, Superwoman. She would have the crypt. You could hurt her with kryptonite. So, so when you're thinking about a, a um, thing about Janine, how much of her difficulties are her own doing, and how much is she a victim of circumstance? Um, a little of both. Like we said before, you know, like what I was saying before, you know, she does make bad decisions, um, but she makes them because she thinks that a lot of times she thinks she has no choice. A lot of times she thinks, well, you know, the world is. You know, the whole theme through this arc is this is has to do with cards. She talks mm. about the stack being decked against uh, the deck being stacked against her. The stack being decked against her. Ooh. <laughs> um, you know, the deck being stacked against her, and this idea of you know, even if you do the right thing, mm. you can still be a victim of circumstance. So. Whereas there are plenty of times where she is a victim of circumstance, there are also plenty of times where she makes terrible decisions because she thinks, well, no matter what I do, something bad is going to happen. So I'll at least be doing what I want to do and what I think is right. Um, and then chips fall where they may. But, you know, she does have a, a bit of a victim complex with her. Um, but, I mean, through this arc, I will say that she does open her heart to seeing how other people are mm. and seeing other people in terrible circumstances and seeing the decisions that they make and thinking, whoa, I didn't think, I didn't think you could do that. Yeah. Like, because she's very sort of singular, you know, there's only one thing I can do in this situation kind of thing, because in her mind, she's always going to get messed over by mm. the system, the cops, the courts, you know, whomever. So she always sort of takes that, you know, um, almost like, you know, ends justify the means in, in her mind. Is her perception of reality skewed in some way then because of that? Cause there's a certain moment in the, in the, in, in the first issue where I think to myself, as she, cause she kind of comes up with a reason for doing a certain act that's obviously illegal. And I think to myself, is, is she kind of hurt skewed on how she's thinking on about things? Like, is her perception kind she, of messed up? Yeah. Well, she will justify her actions. She will find a way to justify her actions. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, not a spoiler. There, there is a bank heist in the story. And, um, and in, in her mind, basically, you know, well, I'm not stealing from people. I'm just stealing from the bank and they got plenty. <laughs> you know, so she so she will ju find justifications in her mind for things. Um, and again, it comes it literally just comes down to her, her 
her distrust in institutions. They've always screwed me over. So I'm going to do it my way. Mm. Whether it's against the law, you know, kind of against the law or not, doesn't matter. I'm doing it my way. Now that she has the power to do things more her way, has that become even more extreme than it would have if she didn't have access to these masks? Well, she, if you read the Dark Web event, she does go a little overboard on certain things. And coming out of that, we try and have her a little more tempered. Like we try and have her sort of live, you know, we try and have her realize that she went overboard in dark web. Um, There were some decisions that she made. There were some people that she hurt that she probably shouldn't have or that hurting them wasn't furthering her cause as much as she thought. Mm. So they were sort of collateral damage in this. So she tries to temper that a little bit, but she still has this, I'm doing it my way kind of thing. And, and her singular goal really is, you know, I want to get Ben out of limbo. Mm. I want to get Ben out of prison basically. And I want us to be able to run off together and, and be together and that's that is my goal and whatever i have to do to get to that goal i will do and that's where that that one you know poor unfortunate soul to quote uh ursula um comes in he was physically standing in her way and so she found a way to get around him so the thing is, though, Ben Riley, for those who may not know, is the clone of uh, Spider-Man, Peter Parker. Yes. Peter Parker, let's say everything goes well. She pulls him out of limbo. How happy is he going to be knowing how she came about doing it? Well, see, that's the interesting thing with Ben, because there are days there. Ben has been written very a, a, a fair few, few many ways. So Ben has been written as, you know, twirling mustache villain. <laughs> um, there was one story arc where he was trying to resurrect Uncle Ben, you know, um, and Peter was like, what are you doing? He's like, well, if we resurrect him, then, you know, everything, I'm making everything right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, and that was just kind of weird mustache twirly. <laughs> Um, And then there are other times when Ben is like a very, very much like a lost puppy. And he Mm. tries very hard to, uh, he leans on Peter because Peter is, you know, spider prime for lack of a better term. And, you know, he, he leans on Peter for the, what did they call them? They called them, I think they called them like anchor memories or something Mm. like that you know, for those core, core memories that make Peter who he is, Ben leans on him for that. And those are, you know, with great power comes great, also comes great responsibility. Then, you know, the Ben Parker lines, Mm. um, the relationship with with Aunt May, the relationship with uh, MJ, the relationship with friends, you know, that, that with the real heart, that is Peter, the real heart, that that is spider-man that that everybody knows um ben leans on him a lot for that um but he went really deep and really dark in the dark web when uh he transformed into the character of chasm he went i mean he was even wearing purple and green you know those are bad guy colors (laughs) um and and he went very very dark in chasm and at one point he took over and he was the king of limbo um, so I'm not going to say if Janine is successful in busting Ben out, I will say that Ben's reaction to it may be a bit of a surprise. So, I mean, obviously, um, the, the method in which he gets the masks, it can't possibly be truly alt- altruistic. There's gotta be a cost involved in this. What, how I mean, obviously, because, you know, they're obviously not doing it just because they're it's, it's nice. It's not, you know, have fun with them. 
What is the cost of this, of getting these masks? Well, we see the cost in um, in this first issue, at least. Um, and, and you brought up a good point. She's not just emulating these things. She is becoming these things. Um, I couldn't say, you know, she, in the first three pages, she puts on what I called the model mask. And, you know, you can't say it makes you look like Marilyn Monroe, but, it, you know, this idea of it makes you look like, you know, this voluptuous, beautiful woman, which is, you know, different from, you know, Janine's a redhead. And she even says the line, like, this is, I, I don't mind this kind of attention you know, as she sort of saunters into the bank. Um, but, you know, something like that, the effect is, you know, pumps your ego up a bit. And, you know, when, you're, when your ego is pumped up, you sometimes make mistakes. Mm. Um, you know, we see the werewolf mask. Werewolves also have weaknesses, you know. So they, she gets all the strengths and all the weaknesses. And um, I think that sometimes she'll pull a mask and not think it through mm. um, because she'll just be thinking, this is what I need, as opposed to this is what I need, but what is the drawback? Or what is the consequence of using this? What is the agenda of the thing that gave her the mask, though? Um, I think we could say, because Derek Webb's out already, Madeline Pryor um, okay. gave her the masks. Madeline Pryor stabbed her with the finger of, I think, Sin, and uh, when they were in limbo, and gave her the powers. Um, it was in, uh, I think it was ASM 14, and it's because when Madeline and Ben were plotting to go up to New York and unleash Inferno, um, Janine was, she was discontent because she said, you know, I feel bad. You and Ben are the ones that have all the actual power yeah. to do this. I want to help and I don't have any powers. I'm just me. And so Madeline gave her this power. She, you know, stabbed her in the chest with this finger, literally a finger, stabbed her in the chest with it and um, said, you know, and this is something from the the original um run of of janine where she's worn many masks throughout her life mm. so now you have those you have the power of of these masks and you use these masks to your own end mm. versus being forced to put on a mask to uh to hide shame to hide your identity to hide this hide that so it's she's trying to give her agency so what sense. can readers look forward to in the upcoming run of Hollow's Eve? Um, I think that they can look forward to some, some wackiness, uh, some funniness. I think they can look forward to people, Janine specifically, having some uh, existential realizations. Um. I think they can look forward to seeing some kindness in unexpected places. And like I said, Janine will witness kindness from, from people and not really know what to do with it. Cause she doesn't, she, she has experienced kindness in the past, but she's never sort of taken it to heart. Mm. And she's in a place right now where she'll say, well, I'm going to do this. And if someone turns around and says, but well, think about how that's going to affect that. Wow, you're thinking about somebody else? You know, that's, but, you know, because she's so singular in, in her goals, that that's, you know, she doesn't stop to think, oh, well, how is that going to affect somebody else? How is mm. that going to, to ripple down? Um, and I think even in the first issue, she, she gets a little, a little taste of that. Well, yeah. that sounds absolutely like I said, Hollow Eve was a great, I enjoyed reading it quite a bit. Um, and as I said, really enjoyed it. And I, and I kind of felt like that was a power that I've not seen before, which is kind of weird in the world of comic books, not to see, you know, see something presented that's new. 
you know, or feels new because like I said, it feels like most things are been repeated <laughs> through throughout the mythology. Um, uh, but it, it was the Halloween you, was really good. I, I'm glad you liked it. Mike Dowling and Brian Reber really um did a great job on the art and um it's it's really been very fulfilling to work with them. I will tell you this. I literally sat down and I was like writing down a list of masks that she could use. And I was coming up with some bizarre ones. And I'm like, okay, well, what would the powers of this mask be? And my husband's like, what are you talking about? I was like, well, what about this? And they could do this. And he's like, that doesn't even make any sense. Like, what is wrong with you? Um, so, I mean, like, I have to pull myself back from the singular focus of finding out these masks, you know? Um, but I, I think that, I think people are gonna, are gonna see some, some, interesting visuals too because mike dowling and i have been having conversations about you know what to show on the page and uh he's been kicking ass and brian reber's colors are, are fantastic so so since you brought it up what was one of the more bizarre ones that you're that you found find it's too bizarre to make into the page do i have it in this notebook let me say <laughs> i don't know if i have it in this notebook i made like a crazy list of masks and it was just like, I was literally just sitting on the couch with my husband going through, you know, just writing things down. And he's like, I, well, maybe this, maybe, no, that makes no sense. What, what are you talking? Okay. Um, okay. I can't say all of them, obviously. Um, a mime. <laughs> the, what's the mime do? I don't know, which is, <laughs> it doesn't have anything next to it. Okay. So I, I had a shark mask, but then the person who puts on, but when you put the shark mask on, because you're out of water, you automatically drop. <laughs> so the shark mask would only be if you were in water. Um, I had uh, a tiger mask um, and you'd have a prehensile tail. Um, I had a gorilla mask, but that's kind of like the Frankenstein mask that she uses in the dark web. Um, I had an elf. But I didn't. Re I was like, would it be like a magic elf, or would it be like a pixie? You know that kind of thing. I had a um, uh, a dog, so you could be like a bloodhound. You could track sense. Um, can't say that. Can't say that. Can't say that. Um, a bear. <laughs> but I was like, it's too close to the werewolf. You you um, gotta do them something with the mind mask. Now, now, now I'm expecting somewhere on mind mask, just like this magic box being made in in, in the air. <laughs> well, that's like that's like what I thought. I was like, you know, me, you know, they there's a in I don't know if you saw Detective Pikachu, but there's like this whole thing about the the mime, um, the mime Pokemon, and you know how you're putting him in a box and everything. Right, right. Like, would the mime be able to like wall somebody up or something like that? Um, but. I, I I couldn't really get it to work, and I've already outlined the fifth, the last issue, so <laughs> I don't think that my mask is gonna make it. Aww. Maybe I can get Mike. Maybe I can get Mike to draw it in the background as like a as a stretch like goal um, to your Kickstarter. <laughs> there's gonna be a mime version of this person. <laughs> You'll make a um. We'll have a Christabel print. mime version. Yeah, right. exactly, exactly. <laughs> Christabel pinup with in a mime mask. Yeah, that'll go well with the medieval theme. I think so. Well, Miss Schultz, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.